Welcome to everybody who's joined us this evening for this Inland Waterways Association webinar on the UK's Heritage Ports and Harbours Initiative. My name is Ray Gill and I'm a planning officer for the IWA West London branch. I first heard about the Heritage Harbours and Ports Initiative just four months ago. Uh, and my particular interest is to see if our IWA branch can lead to Brentford being designated as a heritage port. I'm delighted to introduce our two speakers this evening. Brian Corbett is a trustee for the Maritime Heritage Trust and is leading the Heritage Harbour Initiative in the UK. And also giving the talk this evening is Andrea uh, Rolka, who is the chair of the Malden and Haybridge Heritage Harbour Association. Uh, Malden and Haybridge is on the Chelmer and Blackwater Navigation, a waterway managed by uh, an IWA subsidiary, Essex Waterways. Andrea is heading the drive for Malden and Haybridge to be named as one of the country's first heritage harbours. Um, so during um, the talk, if you want to um, raise any questions, and we'll deal with questions really right at the end after Andrea has um, finished talking, if you just use the Q&A button on your Zoom screen and um, type in any questions um, that you can, you can think of, and then we'll, we'll um, uh, ask the two speakers to address those questions at the end. Um, there is also a chat button. Um, so if you'd just like to indicate um, perhaps which branch you're from, or if you've got a particular interest in um, an inland port um, being designated as a, as a heritage port, um, just use the chat button. So um, without further ado, I'd like now to hand over to Brian Corbett um, to start with the presentation. Ray, thank you very much indeed. Right, our first, um, the first slide How did it all start? How did, how did I get involved in thinking that uh, the United Kingdom could do with having uh, a series of heritage harbours? Well, it all really came from two Dutch people. The first one was Admiral de Ruyter. He's the fine gentleman in that beautiful painting above, uh, that's myself, my grandson, uh, above our head. Admiral de Ruyter, 300 and 53 years ago, had, was, had the temerity to bring across the Dutch fleet and to set fire to the majority of the British fleet that happened to be in the River Medway in Kent at the time. And uh, 350 years later, so June three years ago, they wanted to commemorate that event. And uh, we obviously, uh, well, they wanted to celebrate. We really commemorated because unfortunately, it's one of the very few occasions when our Royal Navy actually lost a battle. The gentleman on the left of the picture in the rather flamboyant jacket, that is um, Fritz de Reuter de Vilt, direct descendant of the Admiral de Reuter. And uh, he was the Dutch coordinator. I was the British coordinator of a, a big Dutch event on the Medway a few years ago. The, um, we had something in the order of 200 tall ships, yachts, ex-naval vessels, historic fishing vessels, all came over to the Medway, June 2017. We couldn't accommodate them all together, so they came over in, uh, in two fleets. And I uh, have to say, next slide, the next couple of slides, show um, what magnificent uh, vessels mm. that we had came over. And uh, yes, you can pass on the next slides. They, we had a real mixture. We had sailing vessels. The uh, left-hand screen there is a modern ship in that the hull is modern, but her engine, she has both steam engine and uh, motors, diesel motors. And she is effectively, <coughs> excuse me, a floating museum. The uh, picture on the right shows a Catalin and um, nice photograph taken through the rigging of one of the tall ships. So carrying on, I think there's another couple of, uh, yeah. So they, the Dutch, as they always do, they're very adventurous. They really put us to shame on the River Medway. Both of their um, fleets, as they came up the river, 
really made, made a tremendous display. During the, uh, during the period, I think, in the Medway Yacht Club, one of my clubs in Kent, we had something like 400 people on two occasions because the Dutch really know how to party. So that was the first of the, um, the Dutch people who really rather motivated me to getting stuck in. Second person was my very good friend, Martine van Leer. Martine um, is a, uh, she's actually the chair of the European Maritime Heritage Cultural Committee. And she has been spending the last few years setting up heritage harbors in the Netherlands. And she gave me tremendous assistance when I um, came up with the concept, came up with the idea of a criteria document to demonstrate to people what we expected of a heritage harbour. Martin very kindly went through and um, you know, gave me a tremendous uh, amount of advice. So carrying on, yeah, that's uh, not more typical. Ah, now we're, we're, here we are in the very first of the heritage harbours. In, um, I think it was the 10th of December, uh, 2018, we had a meeting at a, a, a big uh, building called Sun Pier House in Chatham on the Medway. It's a beautifully located building looking down uh, two reaches of the river. And we uh, had tremendous support from the Thames Sailing Barge community and all of the heritage vessel owners and trusts in, the, uh, in this area of Kent. And uh, we established Medway, the whole of Medway, as being the, uh, the first of the heritage harbours. I've recently added Sheerness, which is right down um, where the Medway uh, enters the River Thames estuary. And um, Sheerness again was, like Chatham, was a historic naval dockyard. And in fact, they've just um, reopened some of the old facilities. Um, for example, a couple of buildings that are in the order of about 200 years old, which will be absolutely superb for, um, for heritage vessels for maintenance, etc. So carrying on, there's the uh, My Rosa, one of the local um, Thames sailing barge. That photograph was taken at the, uh, the Medway barge match. Now Medway, although Medway is not officially a city yet, they have in fact, um, the local council, call the Medway council, they've put in a bid for City of Culture in 2025. So what I'm hoping to do, what we're hoping to do as a part of the objectives of the Heritage Arbor Medway is to um, encourage Sail Training International to nominate um, the Medway as a Tall Ships Harbor in that same year, 2025. So carrying on, we go now to uh, the second Heritage Harbor that we set up was Faversham. Some of the Faversham people, both councillors and uh, the Maritime, the uh, Creekside community attended our inaugural meeting in uh, Chatham and it wasn't very long at all. It was only a matter of a couple of months and we set up the, uh, the Heritage Harbour group in Faversham. Faversham, interestingly, is not a river, it is a creek and we've actually twinned the Faversham Creek and the Ore Creeks. Tremendous history of uh, not only maritime shipbuilding but also gunpowder. Um, the whole of the Faversham Creek area is known very much as the uh, one of the um, one of the main uh, producers of gunpowder in uh, for the UK. So that is uh, that shows that particular photograph shows that all the water has gone out of the creek, very much tidal. Where the handrail is in this photograph is actually taken on a swinging bridge. Kent County Council are actually in the process. That bridge has been um, out of use probably for about 30 or 40 years. Kent County Council are in fact arranging for either the replace the repair of that swing bridge or the uh, replacement with a lifting bridge. We then, together with the sluice gates, will then have the opportunity for deep water in the upper creek. And that will be a little bit like Heritage, uh, like uh, Haybridge Basin. We'll be able to uh, have visiting uh, craft coming into Faversham Creek again. So moving on, the next, um, the next uh, that shows, uh, actually that was a, a very attractive brochure that um, one of the members of the Faversham and Oak Creek Heritage Harbour Group produced that very, very rapidly and, uh, 
and got it out to everybody to say Faversham, if, if um, many of you probably have visited Faversham, it's a beautiful medieval town and it was heritage overkill. But as often happens in the southeast of England, all the various groups very rarely ever talk to each other. And one of the big things about the Heritage Harbour group is that ev all the other groups are now representative on the Heritage Harbour group and now everybody talks to each other. So we're really pleased. So moving on to, uh, um, on to Malden. I won't say too much about Malden at all because um, Andrew is going to be talking about the relationship between the Malden and Haybridge um, Heritage Harbour Association and the Chelmer, uh, the Chelmer, Chelmer Navigation. What I will say is that things have happened at Malden extremely quickly indeed. And that is largely due to the tremendous work that Andrea has actually put in. And again, it's the communication. It's getting any cynicism from local authorities. There's three levels of local authority. Uh, to be honest, Andrea really has got a tremendous, has made a tremendous success in getting those uh, local government offices involved. Now, of course, local government offices with the Heritage Arbor Group, they can see the benefit of having a single point of contact for any matters where they want to talk to the Riverside community, and they really find that useful. So carrying on, we start to look at, um, that's an, another beautiful photograph of uh, going out the, down the River Blackwater from uh, from Malden. So carrying on now, we start to look at the um, start to look at the the future heritage harbours across Great Britain and, and Northern Ireland. Um, it's an interesting point actually because um, although because of our association with the National Historic Ships, um, I should have mentioned at the beginning, I started off um, discuss having discussions with uh, Hannah Cunliffe, who is the director of the National Historic Ships. And uh, we actually had a, a delightful lunch at the Jolly Sailor on the River Hamble down on the south coast. Many of you will remember that that was the area that Howard's Way, the television series, Howard's Way was located. And of course, National Historic Ships is, is largely government uh, funded by the DCMS. Um, civil service department so at the moment as far as the UK heritage harbour initiative is concerned we're looking at the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland but of course I'm also a, a representative of a UK rep on the European maritime heritage so we are broadening our uh, involvement through throughout Europe and of course we're developing rapidly developing a heritage harbour community where we can draw on the experience of the work that Martin has done in the Netherlands and also my friends in northern Germany Flensburg for example tremendous um, example to us all where you've got about two kilometers of beautiful heritage vessels and because the local authority recognized the value to tourism they don't charge anything at all so this photograph is taken on the uh, on the Thames and of course because of the uh, modern especially the clipper ferries taking over most of the waterside jetties um, it's becoming more and more difficult for um, heritage vessels in um, in the in on the Thames around the London River area to find somewhere to leave so we're looking at um, looking at the um, Royal Docks development and the, the advantage of the Royal Docks development, of course, because it's alongside the London City Airport, there can't be any high rise apartments, etc. So, you know, we're hoping that there will be an opportunity to uh, to come up with some not only just um, schooling, boat building school, etc, but possibly even to have a, uh, a, a new um, boatyard facility as well. So going Carrying on and looking at other other areas, and um, that's uh, an interesting photograph of uh, the Dutch, who were the Dutch vessels that were visiting the London River in advance of our big Medway display uh, that we had in 2017. I mentioned Brentford later on, but as um, as Ray uh, said earlier, his involvement is with Brentford, and uh, I mentioned that when I come to the inland waterways uh, part of the talk. Um, another area in Kent is um, Sandwich, 
which is a, a very ancient um, harbour and haven. And it's very interesting because the approach I had for Sandwich was directly from the Dover District Council. So it was really nice to have a, a district council, a local government body, actually uh, asking about the possibility of Sandwich uh, becoming a heritage harbour. So carrying on now into, uh, into the south region, you can see by the number of yachts, although it's a bit hazy in the background, the, that's the Solent. Um, that's looking right across the, uh, the breakwater from uh, West Cows, looking out onto the Solent. Cows, it's rather interesting because the Harbour Commissioners are looking at a new scheme for um, converting the Harbour Commission into a trust. And they're looking at um, having a partnership with the River Medina Trust. And of course, they can see that um, a benefit would accrue and would help their work by uh, cows becoming a um, becoming a, a heritage harbour. So carrying on other other areas in the south region, I mentioned regions because we've allied the regions of heritage harbour. We've allied to what we call ship shaped network regions, a part of the National Historic Ships. Many of you who are involved with historic vessels on the inland waterways will know, and in fact, will have your, some of your vessels registered with the National Historic Ships. And they, uh, they have regions and hubs set up within ship shape region. So we're keeping to those same regions. That, um, that photograph, interestingly, uh, I, I make no, no uh, I'm not ashamed at all. That's me sailing the boat. Unfortunately, a very large and very fast motor yacht and uh, one of these skippers who, who doesn't look either side, he went right across our bow and uh, you know, created a tremendous amount of wash. So carrying on, we're looking at Buckler's Hard. Um, Buckler's Hard is an area I'm sure many of you have been to. Um, Mary uh, Montague Scott, who's uh, part of the Montague family and runs the, uh, the marina and the boatyard at Buckler's Hard, she is already establishing Buckler's Hard Marina and the moorings on the river, on the Bewley River, to be very much a centre of um, historic wooden yachts. And in fact, over the last two years, even, even just after the lockdown period, I think, and in fact, early in September, she held a rally of, uh, of beautiful wooden yachts. So it, it has become very much a, uh, a place which encourages, and they've got a boatyard there with a tremendous amount of room for, for development, which is really good. So we carry on now into the, uh, into the Southwest region. That's uh, looking uh, across the Falmouth Haven, uh, looking across to the uh, the other side of the river. And um, Falmouth, of course, has been for many years, has been a, uh, a maintenance centre for uh, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. That was my, uh, my um, who I worked for when I was a seagoing engineer. And of course, they've also got the Pendennis shipyard there. And the Pendennis, in fact, have carried out um, the... Um, the rebuild of a lot of heritage craft. And again, um, the Harbour Commissioners at Falmouth, they're celebrating their 175th anniversary this year. So their thoughts were, it would be nice if we could establish Falmouth as a heritage harbour during this particular year. Carrying on now into, I think, uh, yeah, we are now into Wales, into the Wales region. Um, Trevor Godbold, a fellow trustee of, of the uh, Maritime Heritage Trust, he's also a trustee of the Heritage and Cultural Exchange, uh, who are working with Cardiff Bay Harbour. I mean, that's a magnificent stretch of water. You can see how still it is. It effectively is a big um, landlocked lagoon now, whereas it used to be open to the Bristol Channel. It now has a barrage system. You have to lock in and out. And of course, what it means is you can have the most amazing uh, waterborne events with a good strong wind in flat water. And uh, I've been to a couple of events then, it really is nice. And you'll see from the buildings, the beautiful big brickwork building, that was, the, um, that was a combination of the harbour and, the, uh, and the, coal, uh, the coal management. But uh, as I say, again, Cardiff Bay is very likely to become a heritage harbour. And is is not um, is not the only um, is not the only one of the of the major. We'll come to some of the 
other major parts of the other major ports as well. So on to the uh, East region. Have I got a, oh yes, yeah. Now that's interesting because that's Clyde next the sea. Clyde next the sea, sadly, is no longer next the sea. It's probably a couple of miles away from the coast. But of course, when it was a, a real busy port in Roman times, it was right on the coast. But um, recently, they have in fact dredged the waterway which goes round to Blakeney and then into the uh, into the North Sea and so it's now in a situation where um, some of the historic fishing boats in uh, Norfolk that sail from Norfolk are relatively small and they can now get right their way up to uh, Clyde and I think because of its medieval and Roman history Although it's a very small port, very small harbour, I think it's very well worthwhile. And what they'll probably do is to group Cly next the sea with Blakeney and Wells next the sea. And then the three together, the groups together, will be, will be a heritage harbour. We've got a similar, similar sort of approach in the, um, further down in the East region, in Essex. Um, we're now actively developing Brightling Sea as a heritage harbour and um, probably Woodbridge and the River Deben. So we'll look at um, Brightling Sea will couple with the other small harbours on the River Cone. Similarly, Woodbridge in Suffolk will group with, um, with places like Wandering Field, the other areas on the, uh, on the River Deben. So off now into um, Scotland. I don't, uh, I don't think I've actually got a slide. No, we'll hang on to that slide for the moment. The, uh, the Scottish involvement really is with Edinburgh Docks in Leith. Um, they, have all, or they are already home to the Royal Yacht Britannia. Um, each of um, Prince Philip's other yachts, the, uh, the Bloodhound, I happen to be a, a crew member on the Bloodhound and we sail her from uh, Oban every August. But um, there is also um, the other yachts, the uh, Blue Bottle and the Cowslip that Prince Philip used to have. They're now uh, in the ownership of the Royal Yacht Trust up in Leith. They've also got very interesting, uh, the SX Explorer, steam reciprocating powered trawler, which um, was turned into a fisheries research ship and she's located up there. Together with the um, Fingal, which the Royal Yacht Trust have rebuilt as a, um, the, uh, a luxury floating hotel, used to be the Windsor Castle. So Leith Docks, although it's a big commercial dock area, there are quite a lot of the earlier and older Victorian docks that would make an ideal heritage harbour. Also looking at, I've, I've, no, uh, I've no photos of Belfast, but we are looking at Belfast. There's a tremendous amount of uh, obviously with the Titanic exhibition, but there is a lot of facilities available now for historic vessels. Right now, now over to the, uh, to the bit which is more relevant to this, to this webinar leading up to your AGM, is what we call the Heart of England region in the Shipshape uh, um, network. Um, it was Amy um, Bernard Hales. Bernard Hales is one of my um, fellow trustees on the Maritime Heritage Trust, and he is um, he's actually um, our main link between the inland waterways and coastal waters because he's involved both with uh, narrowboats but also with Thames sailing barges. So he's helped me a lot, and in fact, it was Bernard who put me in touch with Amy Tilson. And looking at Amy's um, um, paper on the inland waterways heritage, it became very apparent that lots of similar problems of overdevelopment in river and canal system uh, um, ports actually were very similar to those on the coastal harbours. So I've become involved with Ray at Brentford, with um, Jeff and John at Chester, also with Stourport and Warwick Bar. Um, as soon as I can, I'm going to visit each of those areas. Ray has already given me a very good um, tour around the, uh, the Brentford system. So, you know, we're, we're really now starting to develop uh, a large number of ports. I'm not at all concerned because I'm, I'm almost retired from my professional work, so I can allocate a lot more of my time to this system now. Off to... Um, 
international development. I became involved to help the uh, Auckland, the Classic Yacht Association of uh, New Zealand in some problems that they were having with Auckland. Since then, uh, and also since some work we've done in, with Japan, we're now starting to develop not just a European um, a European community of heritage harbours, but actually an international community. And I think that's the fundamental thing. Whatever questions you have, whatever problems you have in your area, then it's, um, you know, it's, it's something we can, we can um, cast the net really widely to get help. So moving on to other, uh, to other slides. We've got a good one. That must be the Chester system. I should know Chester better because I come from that area, but I'll, I'm hoping to visit very, very soon. Moving on again with another slide. Yes, that's rather a lovely building. And it shows, it just shows how valuable it is to keep hold of the older buildings. A lot of the developers would like to raise them to the ground and replace them with great big apartment blocks. And that is one of the main, it's, we don't only want to uh, provide havens for historic craft, but we also want to maintain the historic ports and harbors looking attractive and showing to all our youngsters exactly how the history of their local area, how it all came about. Mo moving on with the slides. These, that's one I mentioned um, Flensburg earlier on, that it's typical. None of those beautiful craft make any, uh, any payment for fees at all. Carrying on again with another slide. Same again, beautiful big steamship, the Alexandra, which uh, operates out of Flensburg. And then I think we get to not quite the last slide. Now these are uh, these these show the um, the diverse diversity of heritage harbors in the Netherlands. There are some very small fishing harbors. And then the next slide, I think, shows us. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Rotterdam. Rotterdam in very many respects is similar to Amsterdam, but it's very much a thriving business city. It's a very young city as well. And in fact, there are a large number of those sort of docks, which are, um, they are havens for lots of beautiful, beautiful historic craft. So over to the last slide, I think. Yeah, just to show some of the most beautiful scenery in, uh, in the UK is uh, some of the most beautiful scenery in the world, in fact, is in Scotland, and that is Plopton, one of the places that I take my little classic boat up to. And, uh, you know, it really is. And I think, thank you, thank you so much for Ray, who showed me around Brentford uh, a couple of weeks ago. A lot of the quiet spots on the river and canal system are so beautiful. Places, big cities like Birmingham and London, they've got little havens of peace and quiet. And it's so important that we can maintain the heritage and to some extent the quietness of those. So I'll hand over to Andrea. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Questions at the end. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? That's fine, Andrea. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, good evening. I'm going to relate in this presentation the Essex town of Malden, which has an amazing historic background from Roman times and was commercially prosperous for a good number of centuries with Haybridge Basin, that part of Haybridge which is on the Blackwater Riverside and is the canal exit of the Chelmer and Blackwater navigation. Here is a drawing of the navigation a canal that is 13.8 miles long from Chelmsford and has 11 locks, two flood locks and a sea lock at Haybridge Basin. My intention is to show how knowledge of the history of Haybridge Basin and the Chelmer and Blackwater navigation deepens understanding of Malden and Haybridge's heritage and extends its potential to attract and inform citizens and visitors. That is its importance. Next slide, please. Haybridge is a town to the north of the River Blackwater in Malden. 
It was originally named Tid Woldington, documented with that name as far back as circa AD 950. But in the 13th century, its name changed because of the building of a high five arched bridge over the Blackwater. High bridge, pronounced Haybridge. Haybridge too has evidence of Roman residences. There are also many historic buildings. For example, St. Andrew's Church of Norman origins, the top photo, and Ventral's five-story warehouse, the bottom photo, built on the Chelmer and Blackwater navigation in 1866. In the middle photo, on the left-hand side of this road in Haybridge, bridging over the navigation, is Goings Wharf, where goods were loaded to go. Bentles on the right, bit right built agricultural ploughs and had this warehouse built on the navigation for their goods to be exported. Next slide, please. Looking at this section of the Ordnance Survey map for the Blackwater Estuary, you see the last view of the 17 miles from the east of the Blackwater Estuary. This is the area covered by the Malden and Haybridge Heritage Harbour Association. Looking to the right of this map, you can see how the Blackwater arches over Northern Island in an area called Collier's Reach, where coal barges used to anchor up because their depth was too great to sail into Malden. Their cargo had to be unloaded onto lighters to be drawn by boats to Malden and then by horse and carts elsewhere. Back to the OS map, look down past Haybridge Basin and see how the river becomes shallow, leaving a narrow channel that passes the Hyde where there are, are Thames sailing barges berthed and rafted up. You see the word Malden and then onwards to a yellow bridge that's Fullbridge that joins Malden to Haybridge via a causeway, and onwards to the northwest goes the river as the Chelmer. In the top left of the map, you can see the words Langford Cut, and below lies a blue narrow strip. That's the Chelmer and Blackwater navigation. It continues to the left westerly to Chelmsford. Going east or right on this map, you can follow the navigation to Haybridge Basin. It swings north over Haybridge residences, offices and shops, and then southeast to the north of a gravel lake to Haybridge Basin. As you can see, there is a gap of countryside between Haybridge, which is north of Fullbridge and the Blackwater, and Haybridge Basin. The village around the basin is linked to Haybridge, but it was established centuries after Haybridge due to the creation of the Blackwater and Chelmer navigation in the 1790s. Next slide, please. Next slide. The land on which the basin was built in the mid 1790s was marshland. There isn't much marshland left to be seen at the basin. On this photo, you can see a remnant of marshland in the fish pet. The fish pet is a small bay which was used in the past for the berthing of fishing smacks. Although the boats berthed up now are modern and there's a crane and a boatyard now on the jetty, there is a sense of what the basin was like in earlier times. In the 1790s, the only buildings in existence where the basin is now were to do with salt pans, a windmill water pump, and the Jolly Sailor pub. Next slide, please. The Jolly Sailor was built in 1793, which was visited by barge sailors with enjoyment, who were anchored up in Collier's Reach. Next slide, please. Here is the basin today. You can see the Jolly Sailor in the middle of the two tall masts on the Black Hold ship. The Collier's Reach is beyond the navigation sea lock to the right of the photo. The navigation coming into existence had an impact on Malden's heritage, so that is why it is so important that Haybridge, with its basin, has been included 
in the Heritage Harbour Association. I'll give you some more information about this shortly. The objective of our Heritage Harbour Association Committee is to work to promote, preserve and secure a future for our maritime heritage. We have a number of aims to achieve this, so I will, will relate aspects of the navigation to some of them to show you what we are doing or intend to do. Our first aim is to advance recognition of Malden and Haybridge's maritime history. As Haybridge Basin is a harbour on the Blackwater, we are concentrating on that part of Haybridge. As already mentioned, the creation of the navigation in the 1790s had an impact on Malden's heritage. This is why. Next slide, please. This is a sketch created <clears throat> in the mid 1500s that shows Malden's Hive. Malden's Hive is an Anglo-Saxon word meaning landing place. It has been a landing place for almost a thousand years, not only for a people, but for importing and exporting goods since medieval times. You can see the black water at the, bat at the bottom, then upwards to a slipway, wharves and quays. On the left of the hive, you can see a crane, to the right a limehouse, on the land across the curved path, which is now known as North Street, coal and chalk were heaped for import and export. Not only were these products waiting for transport. For example, in 1569, Oldman William Eve was a grocer and had imported to Malden High dye stuffs, cotton, cursed cloth, three tons of iron, alum, canvas, 49.5 gallons of oil, base salt, currants, raisins, and assorted groceries. Next slide, please. Also imported and exported by ships, such as hoys in this photo, sailing barges, and little black brigs called billy boys, were coal, timber, chalk, fulling earth, beer, hops and grain, butter and cheese. Wharfs and quays closer to Fullbridge on both the Haybridge and Malden River sides were established and goods were transported in and out of the East Coast rivers and creeks, south to London, Kent and South Coast ports, north to the Yorkshire and Northumberland ports and over the Channel to the Netherlands, France and Belgium. Next slide, please. This is Malden's hive in the late 1890s, where bales of straw and hay were taken from carts and piled onto barges called stackies to be taken to London for the thousands of horses used in the city. The taking of any goods by horses and carts was difficult for centuries because the swampy valleys of the rivers Chelmer and Blackwater with narrow rutted tracks and frequent inclines up and down gravel ridges formed a barrier between Malden, Haybridge and central Essex where roads from Chelmsford transport, transported goods, for example, down to London. The prosperity of Malden increased over the centuries, mainly because of the tolls Malden merchants were demanding. As early as the 14th century, there was friction between Malden and its neighbouring small port of Haybridge, with Malden demanding payment of tolls on all goods passing through its borough waters to and from Haybridge. In 1641, a petition was raised by vested interest in inland Essex to the House of Lords, complaining that Malden's coal merchants were able to starve, by, starve the country by not, not parting with coal, but at their pleasures and at their own rates. Not long afterwards, in 1677, the first of a series of proposals based on plans and surveys were put forward to construct a navigation linking Chelmsford with the Blackwater estuary. Why Chelmsford? Because it was becoming increasingly important, his population was growing, and there was a constant demand for cheaper coal and other seaborne goods from Malden. 
and the river Blackwater was becoming silted and the size of ships was increasing, resulting in either reduced loads reaching Malden or cargoes being partly uploaded further down the river. This caused the tolls on all goods passing through Malden increasing. Another issue was that because of the narrow, rutted and muddy tracks, it took a slow, horse-drawn cart usually two days to reach Chelmsford from Malden. Chelmsford is about 14 miles from Malden. Next slide, please. The Chelmsford industrial and commercial businesses needed goods to come directly to their town. Originally, the canal was to be constructed from Chelmsford into the Blackwater at Malden. However, because of violent opposition from both the water millers along the river and the burghers of Malden, um, which, who were afraid of losing its tolls, the last section of the navigation was constructed to kink northwards of Malden by Haybridge and then south to Collier's Reach. The navigation was completed in 1797. The transporting of goods to Chelmsford fell from eight shillings via Malden to four and sixpence via the navigation. Here you can see the navigation with Malden behind it. Next slide, please. The maximum length of a lighter such as this allowed into the navigation was 57 feet. Its width 15 feet, its height six foot three, so that it could pass under bridges, and its draft two foot six. The opening of the navigation had an immediate impact on Malden's trade. For example, by 1820, the amount of coal tanked to Chelmsford by the canal was 19,492 chaldrons, about 25,000 tonnes, whilst just 8,995 children, just over 11.5 thousand tonnes, landed at Malden. Chelmsford replaced Malden as the chief port for Central and West Essex, not only for coal, but for a wide range of other goods, including stone, chalk and timber. So it is clearly right that both Malden and Haybridge are associated with our Heritage Harbour Association. Next slide, please. Another of the Harbour Association's aims is to improve the facilities for visitors arriving by land and sea. Both Malden and Haybridge Basin have wonderful maritime aspects that visitors enjoy. For example, Malden has the Hive here, where Thames sailing barges are built up. Visitors come to walk along and enjoy the views across the Hive, to go aboard for trips, and to visit the Queen's Head and Jolly Sailor pubs for food and refreshments. We are intent on maintaining birthing for these commercially operated barges and others, including charity and visiting vessels, to extend the visitors' berth for yachts and use the old classroom in the cook's yard area to create a visitor's walkthrough picture of the riverside and the trail with details of specific places to see along the route. Next slide, please. For Haybridge Basin, here is a fabulous photo of a stacky barge loading up hay to transport to London and of a Baltic trader, I think a brigantine. On the left are four cottages built in 1796 to accommodate shipwrights, sailmakers and others attracted by work from the increase in ships arriving. The end cottage became a pub, the Shelmer Brig, which was half knocked down and replaced to become the old ship, which, with the three cottages, are still here today. Where they are is known as Lock Hill. On Lock Hill, and next slide, please. Here on the lock keeper side of the lock, we are working to have installed a window museum similar to the one I've seen in Ipswich, showing the history of the basin and the Chelmer and Blackwater navigation. We are working with Colin Edmund of Essex Waterways on this one. Another aspect I find fascinating and think should be included in the Window Museum is Haybridge Basin's association with eels. 
Next slide, please. In the late 1940s, Haybridge Basin was used for the import and storage of eels. The firms importing them from all over Europe, especially from Holland, had specially constructed ships with perforated tanks, so the eels were stored in constantly circulating water. Upon arrival at Haybridge Basin, they were transferred into perforated tanks, which were submerged alternatively in the brackish water of the basin itself and in the black water outside the sea lock. Most were transported down to London. This activity lasted for many years until the importers moved their business to Northern Ireland. Information and photos of the import and storage of eels will, I hope, be placed in the Window Museum already mentioned. Two other aims of the Heritage Harbour Association are to work on promoting health and well-being in the community and for visitors through the harbours and promoting the harbours, their facilities and history via information boards and other means. We are doing this through establishing walk and cycle paths through the heritage area, not only from Haybridge Basin across Fullbridge to the Hive, but beyond in all directions. For example, along the navigation to Chelmsford. Next slide, please. These photos show part of the trail used by horses pulling lighters up and down the navigation, here close to um, Home Mill. The Heritage Trail project arose from the early days of lockdown, when we had to stay at home and take one form of exercise a day. My exercise a day was walking, including along the navigation canal path up to Home Mill, and the other way via the navigation to Haybridge Basin, and then back along the riverside to Malden, I happily experienced places that I'd not been to before. Wherever I went, I saw so many people out and about enjoying the greening springtime countryside in lovely weather through, walk, through walking and cycling. Setting up a heritage footpath and cycle ride with leaflets and information boards would raise recognition of our maritime heritage and promote well-being and physical fitness. However, there are so many heritage places that there would be too many information boards. Malden District Council has shown interest in what we're doing, so they will be supplying an app similar to the QR code to give information, images and ideas of where to walk or cycle next. This quick response code will be attached to posts for scanning by passersby with their smartphones. Colin Edmund will be giving his advice on this and other potentials for taking forward the heritage of Haybridge Basin and the navigation. Next slide, please. Since 1972, when the transport of commercial freight at the navigation ended, the canal has gradually increased in popularity and there are beautiful heritage places to see. For example, here, the All Saints Church at, of, at Alting of mid 12th century origins. Next place, next slide please. Also, there has been an increasing number of leisure users, canoeing, paddle boarding, angling, walking and cycling from the basin all the way up to Chelmsford, including in the canal to the north of Malden. Next slide please. The importance of Haybridge and its association with the Chelmer and Blackwater navigation being of our Heritage Harbour Association is totally understandable. I must say that the Heritage Association is so pleased about Colin Edmonds' involvement as committee member. We are delighted to work together to do what we can to promote, preserve and secure a future for Haybridge and the navigation's maritime heritage. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, Andrea and Brian, for a fascinating talk. Um, I think that Chelmer and Blackwater and Haybridge Basin particularly are, are now on my list of places I, I, I need to visit. I, I won't go to. Um, and we've got quite a few questions in. Um, a lot of them, 
it actually this seems to have caught people's imagination because um, they're all coming up with um, more suggestions of places that um, need to be heritage ports, perhaps. Um, so perhaps we'll we'll uh, we'll deal with some of those questions together. Um, that's um, the first one I'd like to to um, question. I'd like to see if you've got any response to. Um, Paul Beerman says, what are the criteria used to determine which harbours should be defined as heritage ports? And what are the benefits of being defined as a heritage harbour? Maybe, Brian, that's something that you could um, just quickly... Yeah, answer. funny enough, I mean, I, I, looking at the questions, I appreciate that, um, you know, quite a lot of them are putting forward some other alternatives. Um, I did, um, Alison very kindly put out my latest newsletter to all the attendees. What I will... Well, also... we've lost your sound a bit. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, is that better? Yes, that's fine. Yeah. Um, what I will also do, I have the criteria document and I'll get Alison, I'll pass that to Alison and ask if she will then email that out to all of the attendees. I right. mean, I don't expect... I don't expect an individual small port area to meet all of the criteria by any means, but it really is down to the enthusiasm of, of you know, the individuals who are interested in that area. I mean, I have to say, ever since I've been involved with all of the Inland Waterways Association branches, I'm, I'm absolutely amazed by the enthusiasm that you have. I mean, the, the work that you do, Ray, you know, and looking at all of the, uh, the local planning applications in the West End of London, which is obviously a tremendous development area, you know, that sort of the enthusiasm and the time put in is, is very, very much the justification to an area being, the, uh, being nominated as a heritage harbour, because it is that, it's, it's really the enthusiasm then carrying on to link with education to local children, to tourists to the area, and, and the willingness and the desire to maintain that sort of lovely haven on a, on a river and a canal system. So I'm, I'm more than happy to address and to help as many ports as come up from the whole of the UK system. Okay. Um, my, uh, my email address is on the bottom of the document that's sent out. Don't hesitate to drop me an email. Anybody who you know, wants to promote their area more than happy, more right. than happy to do so. And Brian, what do you what do you think are the particular benefits of of designation in terms of perhaps tourism or um, I don't really, know education? Yeah, it's the cross fertilisation of uh, of ideas. Even though we've only got um, three actual fully nominated heritage harbours, um, the one not represented tonight is Faversham. Andrea and I both. Um, made um, comments on some um, development areas in Faversham and that's helped tremendously. So just getting together as a heritage harbour community, we're not only helping each other, but we're drawing on the experiences of the other areas. I mean, I, I've obviously already in contact with people like yourself, Ray, in lots of potential areas which aren't not yet been nominated but we've already got that dialogue we've all i've already gained a lot from you from the walk around brentford which has helped me tremendously in talking to other people it's yeah. the community it's getting this heritage harbor community is the real benefit and that yeah. includes europe as well okay um, i'll just briefly mention some of the places that um have come up in the questions uh, I'm, I'm not expecting you to address them um straight away um, Howard Anguish mentions uh, Bugsworth and um, Ghoul is a port specifically built to serve the Inland Waterways and may be of interest. Yes. Um, uh, as I come from Gloucester, um, this is Robert Moreland, uh, what about the Gloucester docks or Sharpness? Um, uh, that's, that's very dear to my heart. Right. Uh, because right. Um, when I used to go to school on the ferry across the Mersey and of course, the, uh, I think it's the Egremont is lying at Sharpness. Sadly, I wonder whether anybody will ever do anything with her. But as I say, my misspent youth was spent on my way to school on that lovely little ferry boat. So yeah, all these places, to be honest, have all got very genuine reasons to become. And I've, I've no 
no limit on the number of places at all. Right. So, and know, by all means, all drop me an email and I will make contact and look at the sort of inaugural meetings that we've had already with some of the other branches. Uh, Alan Kerr mentions Clay, which actually came up in your list. He, he raised the question a bit earlier, but um, Clay in, in North Norfolk. Uh, but he also mentions um, both Whitehaven and Maryport in Cumbria, West Cumbria, which I know very well, and um, they are fantastic places. Oh, uh, lovely places. I mean, somebody, somebody asked the question about saying, making the point that it was very sort of Southern based at the moment, to be honest. Um, as, a, as a North Countryman, I dearly want to, and somebody who spends a lot of time in Scotland, I really do want to spread the heritage harbours across the whole of the British Isles. The only reason, because of the uh, post-lockdown period, when for a long time we weren't allowed to stay overnight anywhere other than your own home, and that's the only thing that stopped me going up to Chester. I'm hoping to be able to make my, trist, my trip to Chester and meet Jeff and John over the next, mm, within the next two weeks, I'm hoping. Okay. But there's no, there's no deliberate intent to concentrate in the South area at all. I really want to broaden as, as, as wide as we can. Okay. I, I've got a question for um, Andrea, because um, it seems, Andrea, you've gone a long way down the line and you've actually uh, now set up a, a charitable organization, I believe. Um, for Malden and Haybridge. I just wondered how you went about actually getting your stakeholders on board and getting them together as a group. Um, how, did I, how did I do that? I think it all started, I showed a photo of the Hyde in 2019. Um, it was part of the National Trust Heritage Open Days. I'm um, a secretary for the Molded Little Ship Club and I, I organised that. And in organising it, I started to get together with, um, well, barge, barge owners, a RNS rigging, fish people, um, all sorts of, of people, smack owners, and they came and took part in that weekend. And after that, we heard from Richard Titchener, who was a member of the subcommittee of the Little Ship Club that um, organized that. He said he had been to Brian's first meeting uh, to get, I think it was the Medway sorted out, but I mentioned that, I think it was December 2018, and wouldn't it dip, be a good job if we got Malden sorted out? So that started it all off, and it was a case of having people who worked uh, in on, along the hives, along the riverside, um, who knew people who'd lived there, well, since they were born, most of them, went out talking to a load of people. And gradually, the number of people who started to come to the meetings uh, got bigger and bigger and bigger. So now we have the association established. At the moment, there are 31 members um, there are lots of other people who are interested, uh, but the 31 members all represent either um, a commercial business, um, a trust, an association, uh, the district council, the town council. It, so they're there not just because of what they want, because they are absolutely fascinated with the idea of promoting heritage. They represent an organisation, which is that way too. So having that all together is really helping us take forward what we wish to do. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Um, um, can I, Ray, can I just sure. make a point on that? Um, Andrea has such a work ethic. She really does work hard and she motivates all those other people up and down the Blackwater. 
she really uh, she really shows them by example how well worthwhile it is to work hard on this initiative thank you andrea thank you thank you brian there's a question in from uh derek humphreys who's the um iwa london region um heritage um officer um and i think this is for you brian are you involved with the sank ports but funny, funny enough i was just just about to um type type an answer to derek yeah very much so Faversham, of course, is a sank port and, uh, and is well established now, a lot of effort going on. And of course, I'm just involved, just involved now with uh, um, the, uh, the owners of Edme, the um, Thames Sailing Barge uh, at Brighton Sea. And we're now uh, also, they, uh, they own one of the uh, boatyards as well. So, you know, Brighton Sea and other sank ports. So, yeah, we've got two of them well on the way now. And uh, interestingly, I'm also involved over on the Baltic with the Hanseatic ports as well. So again, you know, again, we'll have the benefit of many hundreds of years of uh, protecting maritime heritage interests in all of the, uh, the Baltic Hanseatic ports. Good, excellent. Um, another question, uh, well, some more places. Burke Hampstead on the Grand Union, um, which I know well. Um, and Libby Bradshaw is chair of the London region. Um, how about the other London docks apart from the Royals, St Catharines, Limehouse and West India for example? Yes, I, I, there is a problem. Places like Limehouse and St Catharines are becoming more and more liveaboard based because obviously the management who own those facilities take a tremendous amount of money from liverboard of course right. what we're really looking for in a heritage harbor is a facility which will welcome visiting heritage craft will provide the opportunity for them to have maintenance and will also provide a link between the heritage and the local residents and um, the reason i mentioned mm -hmm. the royal docks because it is almost like a blank canvas you know there is all all there is a bit of an opportunity for us to really have a uh, have some influence. Hopefully, the same thing, Ray, with Brentford. I mean, you know, although there's a lot of development um, at Brentford, there is still the opportunity to preserve that beautiful, quiet area that you demonstrated to me a couple of weeks ago. But no, certainly, if if anybody wants to put forward other ideas on the London River, I'm more than happy to consider it. Okay, and you say, Brian, your contact's gone out um, uh, to um, the IWA so that people can contact you? All, all the attendees this evening have received my latest newsletter, which Good. has got my email address at the bottom. And I'm okay. more than happy for people to, uh, to make contact all right. through the email. Right, wait for the deluge of requests. So. No, I'm quite happy. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've, deliberately, I've deliberately nearly retired so that I can spend a lot more time on it because right. it's a really an interesting initiative. Okay, um, so I think probably we'll just do one last question. I see that we're, we're sort of up to about an hour now. Um, Michael Aaron says he's curious uh, what might be envisaged for Brightling Sea with its development of harbourside flats. Is that one you know, Brian? Sorry, with the development of? Brightling Sea. In flats. relationship to you know, development of harbour side flats. Ah, yes, yeah. I mean, this is this is the same. There's already been quite a bit of development, but the development further up the River Cone, places like um, you know Wivenhoe, etc., that's already really gone a lot further than you would wish, and that's really why mm. we want to accelerate the establishment of Brightling Sea and the Cone as quickly as we can. I mean, the other thing is, obviously. The intention is to build Bradwell, Bradwell B nuclear power station. So again, we've got to get involved with the developers of power station to make sure that they, rec they recognise the importance of maritime heritage in the Brightling Sea area. Right. Well, finally, I think I'd just like to thank you again for an absolutely fascinating talk, um, Andrea and Brian. Um, and I'm sure thank it'll you. lead on to a lot of further contact with um, IWA in terms of moving this initiative forward and um, 
designated um, heritage ports. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Alison Stanner and Gemma Bolton from IWA head office, who um, in the background um, are at the controls, so as to speak, and um, these webinars wouldn't, wouldn't work without them. So thanks also both to them. So I think um, there we'll close the meeting, uh, the webinar. Thank you, Thank you very much.